Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, those who are watching at home uh, or in any part uh, of this country of ours, maybe even overseas, uh, let me welcome you uh, to the fourth in our series on Habakkuk. Uh, Our reading today is from Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 to 20. For those of you with service booklets, you'll find that on page 4, page 4 of the service booklets. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays, an arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself, he collects all the peoples for himself. Won't all of those take up a taunt against him with mockery and riddles about him? They'll say, Woe to him who amasses what is not his, how much longer, and loads himself with goods taken in pledge. Won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? Then you'll become spoiled for them, since you've plundered many nations and all the peoples who remain will plunder you because of human bloodshed and violence against lands, cities and all who live in them. Woe to him who unjustly gains wealth for his house to place his nest on high to escape from the reach of disaster. You've planned shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. For the stones will cry out from the wall, and the rafters will answer them from the woodwork. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. Is it not from the Lord of hosts that the people labour only to fuel the fire and countries exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who gives his neighbours drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. You'll be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will cover your glory. For your violence against Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of animals will terrify you because of your human bloodshed and violence against lands, cities, all who live in them. What use is a carved idol after its craftsman carves it? It's only a cast image, a teacher of lies. For the one who crafts its shape trusts in it and makes idols that cannot speak. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let everyone on earth Be silent in his presence. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you've got your sermon booklets there or sermon outlines there, we're on page six and you'll find a sermon outline there, a number of points and space to fill in. Uh, Habakkuk is waiting for the Lord to answer him. The year is somewhere around 586 BC. The area is Judah, specifically Jerusalem, its capital. And a prophet of the Lord, Habakkuk, has raised a complaint, a lament to the Lord. Why? How long? That's in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. He's saddened by the state of God's people. They're broken by sin. They're not representing God to the world. The Lord has answered him. That's Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. The Lord will judge the sin of his people in an astounding way. He's raising up the Babylonians to wipe them out. Habakkuk is cobsmacked. He raises a second question of the Lord. I I know you like this, Lord, so why are you doing that? That's in Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 12 to chapter 2, verse 1. And so Habakkuk is waiting for the Lord to answer him. I imagine that he's standing on the walls of his ruined city. He's listening to the cries of the people of God as they're carted out of Jerusalem and the songs of the Babylonians who are triumphant in victory. And I imagine that he's standing there waiting for an answer from the Lord. We're going to look at that today. Let me pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that we can open it. 
We give you thanks for the wonders of technology that allow me to teach the word of God from here and us to listen to it in all of our homes, wherever they are. Father, we pray that as we wait for your answer alongside Habakkuk, you'll open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds to understand your answer and to wait trusting in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. On that point one on the outline, the the Lord does respond to Habakkuk and it's important for us to notice the way that this is phrased, the Lord answers. Uh, God's not forgotten his commitment to the family of Abraham, to commitment to the world. Whatever Habakkuk is perplexed by, it's not changed God's commitment. His fundamental commitment, his personal commitment to work through his own people to roll back sin in the world. The answer the Lord gives comes in three parts. There's a preamble, there's the vision itself, and then there's an expansion. You can see the breakdown there on your outline. What God reveals must be preserved. If you've got your Bibles there, look at verses 2 to 3. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. It's almost as if Habakkuk is to write these words from the Lord down on big stone billboards so that he can place them throughout the city so that God's mob can read them. You can almost picture the image, can't you, as the Babylonians stride through the city of Jerusalem as they take away its inhabitants. Habakkuk quietly walks out and places these big billboards around the city, perhaps in front of the temple in plain view. But the Lord's answer also places his vision in a wider, kind of all a history context. What God is about to reveal is for his people across all of time. Moreover, it's plain to understand. These words have a clarity and a relevance for God's people everywhere, anywhere, anytime. And part of that vision, as we'll see, is that the end is coming. In Habakkuk's day, amidst all that the Babylonians are bringing, God says very clearly, Habakkuk, this will end. He answers Habakkuk's fear from chapter 1, verse 17. The Babylonians will be stopped. But as the vision is written down, as it's preserved, as it's passed to future generations of God's people, to generations perhaps like our own who'll ask the same questions, And God's words take on a bigger perspective. There is an end that will come. And it's the end of all things, the moment when everything will stop. The current circumstances where sin seems to dominate, where the people of God seem hemmed in, where the wicked seem to make God's plans ineffective, these circumstances will come to an end. In both instances, as Habakkuk stands on the walls of Jerusalem, as we read these words now, there will be a period of waiting. God's very clear about that. Habakkuk is to wait for God's answer to his perplexity, and there's going to be more waiting to come, waiting today, waiting until the end of all things. Now, at this point, Habakkuk's received a preamble, an introduction, if you like. What God is about to say is worth writing down. It's relevant to God's people back then and always it will bring an end to all things and God's people must wait for it. The vision itself is a strange one. Look with me at verses 4 to 5. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays an arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself, and he collects all the peoples for himself. Well, it's a vision that seems more like a diagnosis, doesn't it? A description. Uh, It it gives us two groups of people in the world. Uh, The first group, those at the start of verse 4 and then in verse 5, are the crooked, without integrity, puffed up with their own importance. It's not hard to see the Babylonians there, is it? The Babylonians who are currently laying waste to God's people. 
They're the people who take pride in their own power, who take what is not theirs, who rejoice in the sufferings of others. Moreover, there are people who are restless, never stopping, always conquering, always devouring, always looking for the next thing, never satisfied. Like a crematorium that's always open, or like death itself, they devour and they eat and they're never satisfied. You can't miss the connection with the Babylonians who gather prisoners like sand, who gather humans like fish in the sea. But if you pause and if you ponder that image, it's actually a description of all human beings, isn't it? In their sin, no human is ever at rest. In their sin, every single human is an empire builder just on different scales. In their sin, all humans rejoice in their own power, seek their own significance, and they are never satisfied. Does that sound familiar? The second group is different. They're hemmed in. Do you notice that in the way the words are written down? That little part of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4 is hemmed in by the description of the arrogant and the wicked. They're hemmed in by those who have no rest. This second group is the righteous. They live by faith. They stand in sharp contrast with those without integrity. And the contrast is unavoidable. A righteous versus arrogant. Living versus those connected with death. Those who are faithful or full of faith versus those who are restless in their own activity. But what does it mean? It's a really terrific little verse, but what does it mean? How is it possible for any human being beset by sin in their own nature to be righteous, to live by faith? And how does this answer Habakkuk and his question? As we start to unpick what these words mean in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, it's worth starting with some very clear definitions. Righteous means, in simple terms, living in line with God's design. Faith is taking someone at their word and then living like it. A God's vision is meant to take Habakkuk straight back to Abraham. Do you, do you remember Abraham? Remember the promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3? Through Abraham's family, God committed to dealing with the broken state of the world by rolling back the curse and bringing blessing in dealing with sin. God promised Abraham a land and a family and through that family to bring God's blessing, God's approval to the whole world. Abraham battled with the reality of those promises. There were just so many roadblocks, so many insurmountable barriers to what God had promised. Abraham was 75. Abraham's wife was barren. Abraham was a nomad and consistently Abraham struggled. On the one hand, God promises. On the other hand, this is what Abraham was experiencing. Consistently, Abraham responded to this struggle by taking matters into his own hands. He was relentlessly restless in attempting to solve God's problems for him. By nature, Abraham was in that first group of people that God has just spoken of in Habakkuk. Time and time again, he restlessly tried to do God's job for him. At no point did it work well. Just read the accounts and later on in the year we'll spend some time looking at them. Now, As Abraham continued to struggle with God's promise, God speaks to him. Now, turn with me to Genesis chapter 15 verses 4 to 5. Genesis 15 verses 4 to 5. Now the word of the Lord came to him, Abram. This one will not be your heir. Instead, one who comes from your own body will be your heir. The Lord took him outside and said, Look at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. Then the Lord said to him, Your offspring will be that numerous. Abraham's struggling. God has promised a descendant. And at the moment as God speaks to him in Genesis chapter 15, the one who's going to inherit his whole empire is a slave from his own home. And he's going, God, I, I, I'm struggling to take you at your word and live like it. 
Uh, it's been years since you made that commitment to me. Uh, where's this descendant you talked about? And the Lord reassures him that he'll have a descendant from his own body. And then he takes him outside and he shows him a vision that many of us here in the bush are quite familiar with, a, a vision of a big sky filled with stars too numerous to count. And God reminds Abram of his promise. God states clearly to this man, take me at my word and live like it. Trust me. Abraham responds, if you can call it that, in the only way possible. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, Abram believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. It's the exact same language, those concepts and those words that God uses in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Abram took God at his word and lived like it. God credits this man with righteousness. He declares publicly that this man is in line with God's design. Well, here's the heart of that second life that God is talking about in Habakkuk 2 verse 4, talking about to Habakkuk. The righteous person takes God at his word and lives like it. To take God at his word and to live like it is to have God in charge. In essence, it's to have God in his right place, in the middle, in the centre. It's in sharp contrast to the life of the endlessly restless human being that is constantly trying to be God, the life we all live on our own, the life where I am in the middle, the life of sin. Here is the pattern that is reinforced in Abraham. Life is about taking God at his word and living like it. Well, when you think about it, that's actually the pattern of the whole Bible, the design of God, always has been, always will be. There was a pattern there in the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? In Genesis chapter 2. It's the pattern there in the life of Noah, the only righteous man at that time. It's the pattern in the life of Abraham. It's the pattern of life that has God at the centre, living in light of what he's promised with him in the middle, what he has promised and will do. And Habakkuk needs to be reminded of that truth. The Lord's vision reminds him. The Lord's vision reminded Habakkuk that he needed to trust him, to take him at his word and live like it. Now, that would involve waiting on the Lord to do exactly as he's promised. But take him at his word and live like it. God's promise, and it's emphasised again in Habakkuk chapter 1, is that he'll deal with human sin in an astounding way. That's the commitment that the Lord had made way back in Genesis 12 and Habakkuk's doubting the possibility of this as he stares out over Jerusalem and as he sees what the Babylonians are now doing and God expands on his vision, trust me, take me at my word and live like it by painting a picture now from Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6 to the end of the chapter by painting a picture now of what will inevitably happen to the Babylonians to show that God does as he says. It begins to be expanded in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 6. Turn with me there now, Habakkuk 2 verse 6. Won't all of these, the people that the Babylonians have taken, won't all of these take up a taunt against him, the Babylonian, with mockery and riddles about him. They will say, woe, 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 woe. That's a confident assertion, isn't it? When you think about the context in time and history, remember it's being made against the backdrop of the Babylonians conquering and destroying Jerusalem, carting off their inhabitants. And the Lord states very clearly the Babylonians will definitely receive their comeuppance, their judgment, their sin will be dealt with. And the language that the Lord uses here, it appeals to us as Australians with our sense of justice. The conquered ones will scoff at the conqueror as he's brought down and the tall poppy is chopped. But we must not miss the significance of what the Lord is saying very clearly. He is saying that he will always do as he promised, that he will judge sin in an astounding way, that he will deal with sin and the sinner, all sin and all sinners. As those 
pithy statements of woe that five of them are pronounced, you can almost see the effect that they would have had on Habakkuk and those around him as he made them plain in Jerusalem. As he hears these judgments of the overall downfall of Babylon and the end of all things when all sin will be judged, he's given a reassurance that God will do exactly as he promised. Take me at my word and live like it, Habakkuk. In, even closer to home, the wicked within the people of God are being judged and on a wider scale, the one without integrity will have to answer to the Lord for how they've lived. And the five woes that are mentioned here, verse 6, verse 9, verse 12, verse 15 and verse 18, well, they're very clearly cause and effect. The evil and self-centered restless destruction of those who take matters into their own hands will come back to haunt them. But we must not mistake this as people just receiving their just desserts. I don't think it's a mistake. I don't think it's random. That smack bang in the middle of the five judgments, at the end of the third judgment, in verse 14, we hear these words, Habakkuk 2, verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the waters cover the sea. The whole purpose of God doing as he promised is for the world to know him, to know him as God, the one who is the most significant in all of the world. Just as Adam and Eve forgot that truth, just as Abram was taken out to look at the stars to be reminded of that truth, just as Habakkuk had to be reminded of the same truth from remembering Abram, the whole world will come to know it. Because God always does as he says. He is the most significant being, factor, thing in all the universe. All of this is taking place so that the world will know this truth about God. Now when you stop and consider that, it becomes clear that this is the rolling back of sin and brokenness just as God promised. You see, the essence of sin, as we've heard time and time again, is that I'm the most significant being in the universe. Sin is the attitude and action that says, I am God and God is not. For God to be revealed as he truly is, for the whole world to be filled full of the knowledge of the Lord, well, that must mean that sin has been dealt with once and for all. That must mean that I am no longer thinking I'm the center of the universe and the Lord is in his rightful place. In that sense, just as he did in verse 3, the Lord expands on his vision not just for Habakkuk to get through these dark days. The Lord is actually painting a picture of what he will do in the end of all things, not just in Middle Eastern politics. Well, at least in the here and now, the judgment of Babylon did take place. Their rise was remarkable. Their fall was just as swift. They carted off the cream of Judah's society in 596 and 586 BC. But by 539 BC, Cyrus and the Persians had defeated the Babylonians. They rose. They did their job. Their sin was judged. They were destroyed. Who else could do that but God alone? I suspect Habakkuk didn't see that day in particular, that day that the Lord had made clear for him. But as the remnants of God's people returned, they could not have forgotten what Habakkuk had heard. And yet that problem remained in its deepest sense, in the sense of the human heart. Could the Lord keep his promise to deal with sin in the end? And the silence of the Lord reinforced the weight on his words. And the birth of Jesus was heralded as the moment when the one descended from Abraham had finally come. This was the moment, we're told, at the start of Mark and in Luke's Gospel and as Matthew starts in Matthew 1 verse 1. This is the time when God's word would be seen to be right and true and fulfilled as we consider this descendant from Abraham's family. 
And as you look out at the life of Jesus, as you read those biographies of Jesus that have been preserved for us, you can realize that Jesus himself is everything that Habakkuk 2.4 talks about. The righteous one will live by his faith. Let me give you this challenge. Sometime over this period of isolation, when you are on your own, read the biographies of Jesus, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And read them using the glasses or the lens of Habakkuk 2.4 because everywhere you go in those biographies of Jesus, we see that Jesus is the man who takes God at his word and lives like it. Think on the temptation that Jesus faced as the proving ground for his work in Matthew 4, 1 to 11. The offer of the devil is very clear. Here is an alternative way, Jesus, for you to express your sonship of God. Here is an alternative way. Each time Jesus responds with the very words of God and trusts that God is in the center. At the other end of his time on earth in the Garden of Gethsemane as he ponders the moment ahead of him, the moment when he will drink from the cup of the wrath of God on behalf of all human beings, What does Jesus pray? Your will, God, not mine. I take you at your word, Father, and live like it. And so he does. And as he gives up his life on the cross, he commits his very spirit into the hands of God. He trusts what God said at his baptism and his transfiguration. This is my son whom I love. And he lives like it. It's the case throughout his life. He took God at his word and God lived like it. He lived with God at the center like Habakkuk 2.4. He's surrounded by those without integrity, but he lives by taking God at his word. And God did exactly as he said when we get to the book of Ephesians. He raised Jesus from the dead to show that he dealt with sin through the family of Abraham. It's astounding. It's the judgment of sin visited upon the Son of God. And as God raised him from the dead, God was clearly saying, look, you've waited. I've done what I said. Sin is dealt with in an astounding way. I did as I said I would. Is there any more significant moment or person, or power in all of the universe. Habakkuk, I'm at point two on the outline. Habakkuk places his perplexity before the Lord. How can the Lord do this and remain faithful to his promise and consistent in his nature? The Lord answers Habakkuk. His answer is to be written down. His answer is for God's people across all the ages. His answer is a vision of two types of people, those without integrity and those who are righteous and live by faith. The former are destined for judgment. The latter will live. The culmination will be at the end and when God deals with sin in all completion and the whole world will see how significant God is. Habakkuk is to live waiting with faith. Jesus himself The descendant of Abraham is all of this in his very being. In this person, Jesus, the Son of God, God did as he promised. He deals with sin through the family of Abraham in an astounding way. Jesus lived by taking God at his word and living like it. It's no mistake that one of the early messengers about Jesus, a bloke called Paul, another member of the family of Abraham, quoted Habakkuk 2 verse 4 as he described what God had done. Listen to what he wrote to a bunch of God's people in the capital of the Roman Empire in the book of Romans chapter 1 verses 16 to 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew and then to the Greek. For in it God's righteousness is revealed from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The gospel, the proclamation of the good news about God and his promise to roll back sin fulfilled in Jesus Christ, the gospel is powerful because it shows that God does as he says. At its heart is the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, who lived as someone who took God at his word. 
It's received by faith. Any human can be declared right with God in line with his design by taking God at his word and living like it. Put simply, it's to look at Jesus' life, death and resurrection and say that there God did as he promised. It's to have God back where he belongs, at the centre, because he did as he promised. Brothers and sisters, that is life. So let me ask you, do you take God's word, God at his word and do you live like it? Do you accept that Jesus, God did as he promised in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus? That in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, God dealt with sin for any person who takes him at his word. Brothers and sisters, if you take God at his word and live like it, that is life as God designed it. He declares you in line with his design. That has always been the case and it always will be. Brothers and sisters, let me encourage you, this is life as God designed it. Don't be tempted to give in to perplexity like Abram does by trying to do God's job for him, by taking matters into your own hands because you think that God cannot do as he promised. Listen to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 to 39. Remember the earlier days when, after you'd been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings. Sometimes you are publicly exposed to taunts and afflictions, and at other times you are companions of those who were treated that way. For you sympathised with the prisoners and accepted with joy the confiscation of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves have a better and enduring possession. So don't throw away your confidence which has a great reward. For you need endurance so that after you've done God's will, you may receive what was promised. For in yet a very little while, the coming one will come and not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back and are destroyed, but those who have faith and obtain life. I suspect that for many of us, the question that Habakkuk posed, the perplexed question, is something that we've often asked ourselves. God, I know this about you, but why are you doing that again and again and again? Many of us have asked that question. We've been perplexed and perhaps never more than now. But the person who wrote this letter to the Hebrews states very clearly, continue the way you started. It's exactly the same as God's vision to Habakkuk. Wait, trusting that I will do as I promised. Take me at my word and live like it. Our natural default is to get busy, isn't it? To take matters into our own hands, to be people of action and decision, to resolve the tension we see before us by getting our hands dirty. Uh, If it's not that, then it might be just to throw up our hands in despair and go, well, what's the point? Now, don't hear me wrongly. I am not saying let go and let God. I'm not saying that we are to be inactive or gormless fatalists. I'm not saying that we should float like dead dogs on a river just going with the current. I'm not saying that we should give in and give up. What I am saying is do you take God at his word and live like it? Do you trust that he has dealt with your sins? Do you trust that he will deal with the broken state of the world in the end? Do you accept that Jesus Christ in his life, death and resurrection as the descendant of Abraham has done everything for you that you could not? Do you acknowledge that because Jesus Christ has done this, God has removed your judgment for your sins, now and in the end. Let me suggest that there are two very tangible and practical ways that you can display such a dependence, such a waiting. First, do a Habakkuk and actually come before God in prayer and question. Just that simple act of bringing our requests and concerns before God rightly 
asking him to provide clarity, expecting and desiring an answer that will change us. Just such an approach is to live as if God's words are true. Second, wait and listen for the answers by hearing God's words. Look at the stuff that's been written down for generations. A a faithful member of God's mob who lives in line with God's design, who lives as if God's words are trustworthy, is a person of God's words. You read and apply the Bible. I want to finish on a slightly more sombre note. There might be people listening today who remain restless, who remain with eye at the centre, who are so perplexed by what they see in front of them and what they hear that the safest option is to either take matters into their own hands or to just throw their hands up and say there is no point. There might be people listening today who do not take God at his word and who live as if God has no place in their lives. Let me lay before you two questions. First, what is the substance of your life? How is your restlessness going? And second, how will you handle the end? When all those who have decided that being restless and being at the centre is the only way to live, in the end must face the reality that God did as he promised and he is the most significant thing in the whole universe. How will you handle the end? Let me pray. Dear Father, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that you answered Habakkuk. We give you thanks that you had him write these words down. We give you thanks that they are plain to understand. We give you thanks that they speak of the end. Father, thank you for your word. Help us to trust your word and to live like it, to know that in doing so we are submitting ourselves to the one who will judge sin in an astounding way, who is at the centre of the universe. Thank you for Jesus, who lived, died and rose by taking you at your word and who in doing so paid the price for our sins so that our sin could be judged in an astounding way. Father, help us as your people in a time and age which is perplexed to take you at your word and live like it, to bring our requests and questions, our laments and our petitions before you, to read your word and to act upon it. By your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen.